Thank you for the, for the introduction. Uh, so yes, that's right, I'm an engineer at Red Hat by day, but by night I like to think about you know, physics, computer science, and how mathematics and how all of that joins together. So uh, one day I was thinking, uh, what if we let an infinite loop run forever? Of course, assuming that uh, we will cover how uh, we will not be overflowing bits and stuff like that. So I was thinking like uh, if we uh, given some energy budget, how much or how far we can go with this energy budget. Uh, what is the cheapest way to compute and stuff like that. So uh, in the overview, uh, so that was the overview. Next up will be uh, the idea of uh, how we end up with the given energy budget. Then we are going to take a look at how much energy we need to pay for a single bit flip. Uh, then we are going to take a look at uh, the optimized computer that we might want to build to answer this question, how far uh, the infinite loop might go. Uh, then I will show you some tables and I will also later on explain how that solution actually evolves in time, that it's not like constant. And the last thing will be that I will take a look at alternatives. Well, actually it's one alternative, so whatever. So first let's take a look at uh, how we can put together the entire energy budget that we can work with. So uh, I'm pretty sure that you are all familiar with this famous equation. It basically states that uh, the energy of something is equal to its mass times uh, the speed of light in vacuum uh, squared. Uh, of course, that this is like the most simple form of the equation and I'm, go and I'm going to use this one because for example, this one with the gamma term, it gets uh, a little bit complicated, especially because uh, the gamma term basically is a relationship between the velocity of the moving thing as, as compared to speed of light. The problem with it is that we could use the gamma to make the energy value infinitely large. So that's like not really a good thing to work with when we are trying to find out how far we can go using like uh, the limitations we know. So just for the, the illustration, uh, as the velocity of the object approaches the speed of light, uh, the gamma term basically goes to infinity. So this way we could basically supply infinite amount of energy into the system and cheat our way, so that would be nonsensical. So this is the way we are going to uh, work with the, the energy budget. So uh, the cost of a bit flip. The cost of a bit flip is essentially described by something called Landauer's principle. Uh, it's basically, I'm going to explain uh, quickly, uh, the K is a Boltzmann constant, which is, well, this, uh, this number in joules per Kelvin. The big T is uh, temperature of the system in Kelvins. Uh, Boltzmann constant, we all know that, but the temperature in kelvins that I'm gonna use is the temperature of the cosmic microwave background because using anything else, uh, we actually need to supply more energy into the system to cool it down than we would get like bit flips for the same amount of joules. So it makes no sense to try to lower the temperature of the system to get more bit flips for the same energy budget. Uh, yeah. So, how are we going to build our optimized computer? So first off, the computer will not be storing its numbers in the standard binary code because in terms of what we are trying to do, it really sucks. Uh, we are going to use reflected binary code, which is also known as Gray's code. Uh, the main principle behind the reflected binary code is that the cost of moving from one number to the next is always one bit flip. And I will show a table later with a bunch of numbers so that we can take a look. 
and the internals of the adder is going to be composed of so-called so Fredkin gates. Uh, these are these peculiar kind of gates. Uh, they are basically conditional swap gates. Uh, they are universal, which means that we can use the Fredkin gates to construct any of the other known gates, like, you know, and, or, and, yeah, and that's basically it, because the other are just a simple negations of those. And uh, the main selling point of the Fredkin gates is that they are reversible. That means that uh, unless we are actually changing an, an information, uh, there is no cost to it. So uh, the thing is that the Fredkin gates is a little bit different than uh, the regular gates that we are used to because the Fredkin gate has three inputs and three outputs. Uh, one of the inputs is uh, like the conditional bit and uh, the thing is that, uh, as I will show in a second on the table, uh, it will be pretty clear that the Fredkin gate does not destroy any information as opposed to, for example, the AND gate or the OR gate. Uh, so first let's take a look at the reflected binary code. Uh, we can see that, uh, that for example, if we are for the number two, we needed to do we needed to do two bit flips. We needed to flip the first bit from one to zero, and then we needed to flip the second bit from zero to one. On the other hand, using the reflected binary code, we needed to flip just one bit. And so the reflected binary code is essentially a very optimized way of counting. Uh, of course, it has like a number of other uses. One of the most intriguing one, at least, for me is that uh, you will use the reflected binary code as indices when you are optimizing uh, logical expressions using Karnauf maps. So uh, the reflected binary code will be basically the way you annotate the rows and the columns of the Karnauf map and then you, know, you can basically use uh, the, the collocation of ones and zeros uh, to optimize uh, Boolean expressions. And uh, speaking about the gates, if we take a look at, for example, the end gate, uh, we basically have three inputs which all result in the output being zero. That means that we cannot reverse from zero to the inputs because we have three inputs matching one output, so we cannot go back. We no longer have the information to go back from the zero to uh, either of the inputs. Same for the OR gate and same for the XOR gate. So this is why these traditional gates are not reversible because they truly destroy the state of the system. So let's take at some tables of the energy. So like the most basic one would be basically one joule. Uh, which is an energy required to heat one gram of water by 0.24 degrees Celsius. It's truly like nothing interesting, but if we put, uh, if we plug the one joule into, uh, if we basically uh, plug the one joule into the Landauer's principle, we get the cost of a flip bit, and then we can, you know, like divide, and uh, we will get that uh, we could using one joule of energy, we could count up to two to the power of 109. That's pretty nice for just one joule of energy. We can move to like 8.4 kilojoules, which is a reference daily calor caloric intake uh, of a human adult. That is like two to the power of 125. And for inspiration, I just uh, added a bunch of others uh, interesting data points that I could find. Uh, so, for example, if we take a look at the bottom of this table, the total energy output of the sun per second, we could count up to 2 to the power of 198. So, this is all nice and well, but I was thinking, you know, in a slightly bigger terms. 
so how far could we actually go if we harnessed the entire power of, let's say, uh, the solar system? So if we took the mass energy equivalent of the entire solar system, we could count up to two to the power of 266. As you can see, you know, like, uh, one joule of energy took us to two to the power of 109. We burned down the, the entire solar system. Must have been like a glorious explosion. And we managed to count up to only, well, only two to the power of 266. But that's nothing as compared to uh, the mass energy equivalence of the entire universe. So using the energy of the entire universe, it actually, you know, we don't get that much further away. And that's, uh, that's the idea basically behind the exponentiation, that it grows and grows and grows. And uh, even when the number in the exponent seems like, you know, it's like, I don't know, 200 away from this one, but the difference, the actual difference in terms of what we can do with the energy is uh, just, yeah, sorry universe that we had to destroy you, but uh, it was necessary. However, these numbers are not constant. They change in time. So the first point is that the space expands. That is something which was discovered by the Hubble, I don't know, something like 90 years ago. And ever since, it's like this little big mystery, why and uh, how, basically. So in terms of what we are doing right now, this influences the numbers in two different ways. So uh, as the space expands, it actually cools down the cosmic microwave background. This means that uh, as the temperature goes lower, uh, we can do, the cost of a flip bit goes down as well. So we can compute more for the same amount of energy. On the other hand, uh, as the sp space expands, uh, things get further away. And as a matter of fact, things are getting so further and further away that even if they were moving towards us, at the speed of light, there is a fine, fine distance at which it wouldn't really matter that the thing is moving towards us at the speed of light because the expansion of the space-time would actually sort of uh, negate the speed because the space would be expanding much faster than the thing can uh, be moving towards us. So in a sense, uh, the, uh, the energy budget of our uh, current Hubble volume as the time e evolves goes down and down. So because I wasn't really able to find like uh, good numbers as to uh, how lower the temperature of the CMB gets over time and also uh, how the energy density of the Hubble volume changes with respect to time, I mean like our Hubble volume because that is basically a term which describes from the point of the observer what is your sphere of influence, what is all, uh, the, what is all the information that we can get from the universe. So uh, it's not clear to me right now. I will definitely uh, try to follow up on that and figure out what is the relationship between these like as the temperature goes lower, we can compute more, but the volume shrinks so we can compute less. And I would be really interested, like, what is the ratio between these things? So yeah, I still have to figure that one out. And I think that I'm getting uh, to my last slide, which deals like with an alternative way, which is even more extreme than the one I just presented. Uh, so the alternative approach is like the black hole, black hole universal computer, which was uh, published something like 15 years ago by Seth Lloyd. Uh, it makes a bunch of 
assumptions. So the first assumption is that it assumes that uh, our universe is a black hole with roughly nine to the, uh, 10 to the power of 90 operations per second. Uh, it also takes into account the mass, the mass of the observable universe to be something like uh, uh, three times 10 to the power of 52. Uh, and then it basically uses the knowledge that uh, black holes seemingly evaporate in time due to the Hawking radiation. So uh, black hole this big, this size, will roughly evaporate over the time of 2.8 times 10 to the power of uh, 139. Which means that if we uh, take into account the lifetime of the black hole, plus the number of operations the black hole can perform every second, we get to the number that the total operations, assuming that our universe is a black hole, you know, like, we don't know really if this is the case, there are some, like, weird arguments which correlate like uh, because like in the like well let's say that in the middle of every black hole is the thing so-called singularity which is basically an infinitely small point in space which actually it extends into infinity so if we know or if we assume that our universe is infinite as well it sort of works out that we could be living inside a black hole and that uh, this could be like the actual upper bound for the computation. And yeah, that's basically it. Thank you for listening. However, I would like to, uh, so why I was thinking about all of this, uh, let's say that uh, we use the circuit or the computer that we designed a few minutes before and that we try, for example, to, I don't know, use a little bit more of Fredkin gates to actually, uh, let's say, break some encryption scheme. Uh, using these numbers, we can actually figure out how impossible it is to try to start with some initial key and then try to explore the entire space of possibilities. Uh, for me, these numbers are quite humbling because even if I go back to like the number, the maximum number that we get to using Landauer's principles, it basically means that, I don't know, it's like, uh, imagine a square grid, 18 by 18 maybe, and now just imagine that we have a bunch of stones that we place on the grid. Uh, and the thing is that this number tells us that we cannot explore every possible combination of placing a random number of stones on the grid in this universe. There is just not enough computational capacity to explore every possible configuration of uh, these things. So when we think about, uh, let's say, the the match playing the uh, playing the go game with uh, like the deep mind playing the go game against human beings some people like to say you know but it's a big computer running a lot of stuff at the same time it must be able to explore every possibility that there is however we see that uh, even uh, i think that the professional games of go are played uh, at the board, which is like 19 by 19. And we see that uh, it is simply impossible for the AI to explore all the possibilities and take them in into account. There has to be something, something like clever, cleverer than that. So yes, that would be it. Thank you for listening. And I guess that we also have some time for questions. Yes? So, what was the question that people have a couple of questions about the planet theory? But you said on gamma and CP2, uh, the gamma comes from the speed, which means you have to accelerate, so you have to actually inject energy to get that speed. Yes, yes. And the computation happens in the frame of reference 
of the moving particle, so it, it doesn't get more energy. It is it's more of a so it doesn't move more. It gets more energy, but it's more exciting. Yeah, so I was thinking that... Well, so I can't by your argument. Yeah, so uh, to repeat the question that uh, the, the gamma is dependent on the frame of reference, that so I was actually thinking that we just, you know, uh, make the boom happen and then we channel the yeah. energy from that frame of exactly. reference if you want someplace else. Exactly. Exactly. Your, your universe, then you need another universe. Exactly. Then, then yes. Yeah, it's it would be a big, very destructive kind of thing. <laughs> and <laughs> so, yeah. But then my my question uh, was, um, your computer is really optimized. But it's not a general computer because it doesn't have a program counter, loops, anything yes. and stuff like that. So of yes. course, you would need more energy for all these kind of things. So um, did you try to see what was the universal computer that would use the least energy? The would use the least the use the universal computer that would use the, the lowest amount of energy. For instance, can you build a computer oh, no. where it's program counter, decoding and so on, use the case we're talking about? No, I didn't really try that. That would be like too much numbers for so my. Can you do that for next year? Can you do that for next year? Can you do that for next year? If you start now. I think that if I start right away, I might be able to. But yeah, I'll keep that in mind when I'm thinking about what to do next year. Thank you. Have you think about uh, creating some EU regulation that there should be agreement? Computation <laughs> to save the energy. Well, so, so you would like propose that for for this you can spend that much energy. So. <laughs> I think I think we could do that. You know, I just need a like proper representation in the e e European Parliament. You know, I think it could be. I think it could be possible. You know? Those guys will waive everything. So. Yes. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Like the Landauer's principle basically sets the lower bound for the cost of a bit flaked using classical terms. So like a front or some kind of classical particle. Yes. No well I'm yes, yes, it should be that. It it should be using classical means, nothing no quantum weirdness. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because my point is like maybe we, because that looks like a lot of energy that that you can uh, like one job to, to just do that big thing. Mm -hmm. That one thing not like a lot. So I would wonder if we can optimize it something like that. I think that we could optimize it by building the whole circuit or the whole mechanism, let's say that uh, I mean just going through all the numbers makes no sense, right? So uh, we would like to also do something on top of that. So let's say that we would like to check whether this combination of bit flips can decrypt some payload. And in that sense, we could implement the next part, which would be checking whether the payload is valid using the Fredkin gates as well. That means that they would consume no energy and the final output of the whole thing could be the one single bit of information. Does it break the cipher or not? And uh, or did we get the right key or not? And by initializing the circuit, like with the result being equal to zero, then we will be basically checking every possible number which could represent the key. But because none of them would actually break mm -hmm. the thing, the the output bit would still be zero, so we wouldn't be flipping any bits. So technically, we could pay the energy for breaking the key or the cipher or deciphering just the payload by uh, paying the cost of one single bit flip, because we would pay the cost of the bit flip only for uh, the last operation, which would actually find the valid key. And that could be that could be implemented using like I guess that now we sort of venture into the into the domain of quantum computing using this. So yeah, it's be interesting to see the quantum computing all this. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah. Well, first, I think we need to see actual working quantum computer because none of those that uh, those companies are selling right now, uh, it wasn't proven that they are actually faster than classical computers using like optimized uh, way of solving the problem. So we still do not know whether the quantum actually is a thing or not. It's definitely weird, but we still don't know sort of what to do with it. And so, yeah, we are out of time. So thank you again.